The following was recorded in front of a live studio audience at the Studio 21 Podcast Cafe. This is the United Podcast Network. Welcome to the Quirky Dog Podcast, inspired by some of the quirkiest dogs you can ever imagine and the owners who love them. This podcast is brought to you by the quirky couple themselves, Scott and Jess Williams. Their aim is to educate and entertain. Here's Scott and Jess. <laughs> Welcome, guys, and happy Wednesday. Oh, look at Scott. <laughs> He's got his whole harem. We have a very special guest here today. We got Nancy Drukas. She's one of my closest friends and has become one of your closest friends, I guess, because all my friends become your friends. Harem scare em. <laughs> <laughs> Happy. Happy almost October. We're drinking. One, yeah. Nancy and I, uh, we're winos to begin with. This is... <laughs> Part of our founding friendship outside of dog training, but also those freaking debates, man. I'm fine drinking before noon the rest of the week. Well, I'm sticking with coffee. Mm. <laughs> That's for everyone. One one sober party here. <laughs> That's for everyone's uh, <laughs> safety's sake. So, Nance, welcome. Uh, here's the Quirky Dog Podcast. We run a real tight ship, so don't screw us up here. <laughs> We're coming up. Our fiftieth episode is going to be um, in October. Can you believe it, sweetie? No, can't believe it. <laughs> Uh, Scott's on I, like, I'm so thrown off by sitting on the opposite side of Jess. <laughs> Honestly. It's going to affect me for the rest of the podcast. <laughs> well, the good news is your tooth is on the other side. Did Scott, we talk about my broken tooth already? Yeah, well, you time? mentioned it with the peppers, but Scott needs to get a crown. He's got a tooth missing, so I like now to I be on the, the side. Now I keep the mic right over that tooth. Like I'm to all be, set. I like to be on the side with the full set of teeth. All right, so we're going to start with the quirky tip of the day. you got to be the pig oh, handler. Okay. Maybe we could bring in, in my... In the- I want to bring in my fake tooth kit. For the next episode. Oh, but and we can install the fake maybe, tooth. I oh, got yeah. it on Amazon. Ah, yeah. four ninety five. Well, the crown. So a, the crown was going to be twenty one hundred. We twenty one hundred or four ninety five. You pick. <laughs> Just get a chiclet. <laughs> screw it's, it. It's pretty close to a chiclet. Maybe well, maybe when we do the tooth live, that'll be the quirky tip of the day. Yeah. But today, if you own a kennel or you have like a small board and train business and you're planning on expanding uh, to a greater setup, Nancy, you've owned your whole kennel setup for how long now? How long did you? When did you move? Uh, twenty thirteen. So seven years you've been in Raynham, and what do you use for a software? Because a lot of people ask us about software, and we never needed one. I was just the software. Kennel connection. Okay. I can't remember how many times I've been asked about software for <laughs> dog training facilities. I mean, <laughs> pulling my hair out. Well, if you get a lot of if dogs. If you've ever dreamed about owning your own dog training facility, we're going to squash that dream <laughs> yep. today. Yep. <laughs> what is on a nightmare? The kennel, the kennel connection. Well, honestly, we all kind of all get along even on a different plane because we've all lived in our facilities too. Right. You've recently moved home, but you had I quite know. the stint there. Yeah, five years. Yeah. Five years you lived there? Yeah. I'm sorry to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> we lived there a year and a half, and it got to be a little bit much. All right. Today, we're going to focus on the importance of um, pet dog training or manners or whatever you want to say um, as it relates to dog sports, because Nancy is a competitive dog sport person. Scott and I have competed in various dog sports over the years. And the bottom line is, if your dog listens better at home, you're probably going to do a little bit better in the ring or on the field or whatever else. So I know you don't want to do this, but just do a quick little rundown of well, you and the Yorkies and what you do with your life and just so people know who you Yorkies, are. Yorkies, did you say? Yeah, yes, she used to train. I had Yorkie. Yorkie oh Terriers. Say it so Scott can nightmare. learn. <laughs> <laughs> that was my first <laughs> utility dog. And you stuck with it even after the Yorkies. Huh? I know. Go ahead, let's Taught hear it. me a lot. Five pound Yorkie. You don't what go you whipping doing? him around. Are you doing protection or what? <laughs> <laughs> Police work. <laughs> that's a lot of bending over with a small dog. People don't realize yeah, it, but that's yeah. a lot on their back. Susan yeah. Garrett, we used to do Jack Russell's a lot, and she had back problems for a while, and she just had a PVC pipe. She would just drop, <laughs> she would just hold it and then drop the cookie down, like, yeah. there you go, it's through the pipe. All right, so tell us a little bit about your history so people know who the heck you are and why Keep you're so great. Keep it brief, okay? It's only a half an hour show. <laughs> <laughs> I got a Yorkie because I wanted a grandchild, and then it got me into competition obedience, and that's the <laughs> nutshell version. <laughs> Then I went into business, and here we are today. Well, you well, have a lot of nice goldens, though, now. Yes, I have golden. goldens. So yeah. I, I competed with the Yorkies, uh, got utility titles on those. Then well, was the Yorkie difficult to, that got you into training? or Because a lot of times difficult dogs are, what, are kind of like the what catalyst. get you into training, and then you take it further, many people. Actually, he was very cooperative, um, and I didn't really treat him like he was a Yorkie. I just thought he was a dog. You know, so well that's unique, right there. You treat them like a dog. That's, yeah, that's nice to hear. Because <laughs> well, they don't. Yeah. Back in no, the day, like, we didn't know the term fur right. baby. That was, that was that was the good old days when I was in diapers. <laughs> so it, you know, it just evolved. I mean, I didn't 
So he's the one that... Might have asked you what year this was? 92. Okay. So what type of uh, training, when you went to your first class, what kind of training were they doing? They had a choke collar and... Was it a group class you went to? No, my husband got me a private trainer. Okay. And he came once, Mm -hmm. popped the poor little dog. I was heartbroken. I bet. And I said, you're going to hurt him. And he said, no, his neck is stiff. He'll be fine. Had to loosen that neck up a little bit. So when he left, I said to my husband, he's a flaming asshole. Yeah. And he said, well, I've already paid, so he's coming back. (laughs) It's like, well, I'm not going to do what he says. Right. He says, he just sighed. He's like, oh, God, here we go. That's my wife, Nancy. Right. (laughs) And there was no internet at the time. So I had hot dogs. I said, I'll get him to do it with a hot dog. And that's how I started. Yeah. And, and I just, you know, that's showed. kind of the principle of today's canine top performance. That's not even the right name. Oh, that's right. Performance Plus. Performance Plus. Nancy owns a dog so training did facility you in Raynham, Mass. So called you had enough Plus. Uh, intuitive knowledge yes. to get a lot of behavior out of this dog with food. Yeah. Well, I had kids, so you can't go beating them and get them to do things. At either. least yeah. legally, these days. Right. Right. Yeah. So it just, the, the dog was very willing and biddable, and I wasn't, um, I, I, I just wanted him to wag his tail and look cute, Yeah, you know, and just do what I wanted. So I wasn't... Um, he had good food drive. Yeah. And, um, and he liked the interaction. So it was more the interaction and the food just kind of like punctuated. Right. So I didn't just rely on the food. Yeah. I, re- I really liked the dog. Well, the dog liked to work with you, too. Yeah. That's a big plus. He was a really sweet, sweet dog. And he was a puppy. Yep. Yeah, so you yeah. raised him with this interactive relationship. So you went from yeah. Yorkie to Golden, then? Is that how that went? No, nope. I went from a Yorkie to a Rescue Black Lab. That was uh, my cousin's dog. And only liked men and only looked at the ground. Mm. And I convinced But they're pretty food motivated, too. Yeah. I convinced him women were better and look up. And she was my first arch. So between the Yorkies, I had four Yorkies, because they're like potato chips, you can't just have one. <laughs> <laughs> and they're small, so you so, can yeah. a lot of them at home. So I could have two in each armpit. I called them my <laughs> armpit dogs, because I could carry them around the show under my armpits. <laughs> And then I get the, the lab. Anyone who knows Nancy now knows truly how funny that is. I'm going to start giving you some stuffed animals to carry around at shows now. All right. So then the lab to the Goldens, right? Yep. And now you're like golden cuckoo yep. crazy. I wouldn't go back. Yeah, well, you got hang on. Let's back up. When you worked with the Black Lab, you had to join a club or something, I'm assuming, didn't you? Um, I actually took... Because um, how do you know competitive obedience from... Well, I learned it with the Yorkie. I joined Park Shaw um, Canine Club, which You joined was, a club, right? Yeah, which was in a... Um, BFW Hall or something. There's a lot of rules you got to learn and all that stuff. Right. Yeah. So I got involved there. And then I started going to seminars. I'm compulsive Mm -hmm. and and anal. So I need to know what it is I'm doing and why. Mm -hmm. So I started reading and going to seminars and just asking a lot of questions and going to dog shows and watching. That gets more confusing at that point. Well, it worked for me. Yeah. So then I um, got the lab. And um, I met Andy Vaughn, and um, she became my trainer. Mm-hmm. And, it, and she, she was really very successful. I was a nobody, just having fun and becoming addicted, but I didn't know it. Mm-hmm. And um, I was working with my lab, and she came up to me. Now, I knew who she was, and when she started talking to me, I was like, oh, my God. You know, I was like starstruck. Oh, my God, she's talking to me. Just like when we asked her to be on the quirky dog today. Oh, Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So she asked me how I got my dogs to give me such great attention, Mm -hmm. the lab. And I looked at her and was like, hot dogs. That's what I said, (laughs) with a hot dog. And she said, well, what did you do with the hot dog? What technique did you use? I said, oh, I don't have a technique. I just gave him a hot dog. Yeah. He said, you, she said, you had to have done something. <laughs> there was a method to the madness, lady. So anyway, we had a conversation, and sure enough, she, she took me on as a yeah. student. Well, Nancy's Goldens today, I mean, I know three of them who work with her now that I know most of their careers. And I mean, Nancy definitely is and is going to be in the next end of COVID year and in 2021, one of the best obedience people out there that's still using positive methods without using balance training and kicking ass and the dogs look good and they work well and they're fast and they're drivey and it's hard to do it's hard to do in competition obedience now because it's gotten more watered down I'd say than when you started right yeah 
And competition obedience, just for you guys who know, is like the dog sits across the ring, runs to the front of you, then you finish them, they do a healing pattern, you know, it's judge, it's very meticulously judged, there's not a lot of room for error, it's very specific, the dog's angle has to be specific, the dog's timing has to be just right, you know, you fail one exercise, you fail the trial in a lot of ways, so it's really, it's a lot of militant work, and you yeah. hate all that little minutia. Well, uh, it's hard to um, fail a trial because of one exercise. I mean, I come from a, a, a dog sport where you can uh, get a zero on two or three exercises right. and still you could come in first place. Yeah, no, you can't you do know, that in competition yeah. obedience. <laughs> right, because it's all about, I mean, because we're doing different phases. Mm. But yeah, it's tough. And the difference, I would say, between your background more so and Nancy's background, and I would say at this point, I'm more of like a Frisbee and agility competitor, and I haven't done really competitive stuff in a while. But we all come from various backgrounds. So Nancy's competitive um, obedience. Scott is more protection sports. And really, for you at the high level, it's like two five-minute routines in one day, right? Yeah. And for Scott, it's a one 45-minute routine with no equipment on the dog. I mean, it, at the high level, it gets pretty intense. So it's a different amount of time on the field, different amount of training, everything else. But the common thread here is that the way that you interact with your dog does affect how your dog is going to perform, whether it be good or whether it be bad. And what I like about all three of us up here is if our dog is like going to pull us to the field because they're a little bit less confident, they're a little bit unsure, it's their first trial, all three of us are going to recognize like that dog's going to need to build more confidence. And we don't care if the dog looks a little crazy going to the ring because we know when we can reel the dog in versus people who are really concerned about like, oh, my dog has to look perfect at this point, this point, this point, this point. No, like you're working with the dog that you have. And you're at the advantage right now because you have a really pretty weak dog and then a really pretty strong dog. Right. And then you have a nice puppy. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. so you're all over the board. But yeah. you have to, you're playing a different game. Yeah, with each dog. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Mentally and even interacting at home and all the yeah. time. Like we joke, you know. Nancy's like, Gimme's getting out of control. I'm like, let him bark, let him break. Like, because, you know, each dog is different. And I, you're like that too. And you have to recognize that for what it is and put your ego aside and let your dog shine in a certain way. That's why I let Jimmy be so disobedient around the house all the time. <laughs> oh he, I'm, I'm constantly trying to build this dog up, and Jess is trying to shut him down. Oh my God. You know, one thing I will say that a commonality is that um, I think all three of us were able to establish some relationship and some engagement with our dogs before we get into the formal training. Yes. And there's a yeah. lot of people that come yes. for the formal training that they're so disengaged and yeah. they just, it, to be able to even create that relationship is just almost impossible. Yeah. yeah. Or yeah. they've been doing formal training for three years and they actually haven't gotten into the relationship part at all. And that part does, it exists at home. Right. It exists in the morning when they're going out to potty in bed. Some, like that is like your relationship at home factors in to what you bring into the ring. That's well, the key component. Yes. Key it reminds component. It reminds me of that Fred Holm uh, seminar we went to. He went, he took a dog, and he went to the, his first classes. And they said, well, how do you title the dog? And, he, you know, they, he said, how do I get the dog title? So you got to do this title here, and then you got to go to a different judge and do it over here, and you got to do this. And he comes into the next class and says, oh, I got the dog title. <laughs> I'm like, what are you talking about? Well, I took him down here, and then I went over to Connecticut, and then I went to this one, and he, he, he won all three things, <laughs> and they couldn't believe it. And he was just right out of the gate. That was like his, in his first six months and of I training think, or something. Yeah, this yeah. is something he just that's, had a natural aptitude for it. And know? it's something that's often overlooked, um, but I think it's an important thing to point out, and then we're going to have to go to break real quick. But um, Already? Gosh, I know. I when know. Nancy's oh, here, son of a... But when Nancy's here, he wants to go long, long, <laughs> long stretches. Um, no, but there's a certain intuitiveness to dog training, yes. whether... You grew up with dogs since you were three years old, or you started in dogs when you were 55. Some people, and that's partially what happens with Scott, too, and he doesn't realize it because he's just like, oh, I'm a salesman. I've sold stuff my whole life. I just sell dog training now. Like, no, like, you have to freaking be able to work with a dog. And there's only so much that you can read, learn, et cetera, right. et cetera, et cetera. Like, you have to have a certain amount just built into you. And yes, right. experience helps, but right. that's one thing I would say that all three of us have certainly. And the funny thing about us, Nancy and I train together more frequently than the three of us, but the three of us can train together and we've had fun doing that too, is we can see one problem and come up with it from three different angles and have a good discussion and, you know, respect everybody and see the different viewpoints. But we all have that intuitiveness with that we can actually work with a freaking dog in the first place, which you, is important. You guys get nervous when I bring up my angle. <laughs> <laughs> There have been times. Can you, can you save some of those till after break? All right, we're going to go to break real quick for Coranda. We got a quick, quirky question of the day, and then we're going to get back to really more wine drinking is all I care about. So we'll see you after break, guys. What makes Coranda beds chew-proof? 
Only Coranda beds have a patented design which secures the fabric inside the frame, making it totally inaccessible to jaws and paws. Your dog can't chew the fabric because we've hidden the edges inside the rails. Dogs love Coranda beds. See why? Coranda beds come in a variety of custom sizes. You can even add a fleece pad on top for extra coziness. And these beds can be used both indoors and outdoors. But best of all, our beds are easy to clean. Just wipe them off or hose them down. Visit dogbed.us slash the quirky dog for more details. I'll squeak oh at the question. God. All right, hey. Please don't speak again. Squeak. squeak. She said oh, squeak, squeak, not speak. Oh my God. <laughs> And she knows how to keep Scott at bay also. That's another good... That's why I'm sitting so far away. <laughs> Are we supposed to be looking at that thing? It no. doesn't matter. You do whatever. I just Don't stare. worry. There's nobody on the other side of it. I just stare at Scott because he's so handsome. All right. So let's talk about this Corandas. Yeah, he is. Let's talk about Corandas before we get to um, the quirky question. So you have those all in your kennel, right? Yes. And you love them. Are you yes. part of that rescue uh, thing that they have on their, on no, their website? No, she has no. a kennel. Oh, I know, but the kennel, they give them, they, like, for some rescues. people. For rescues. I don't rescue. Oh, it's not just for kennels. It's only you for rescues. You said, do you have it like rescues? She's a kennel, a, a kennel where a people boarding. pay her. I was thinking of the program that Coranda has. I know, for rescues. If they put their name on there. But now that we are opening you up to rescues, <laughs> I'm not if rescue. you have a we dog have a, that you, you need know, to bring home. <laughs> yeah, we have a few dogs we could drop off. Uh, no, no, no. But nope, you, nope. they work out well. <clears throat> They've done well for you, right? Yeah, they yeah. have. They have. No, they they've don't. stood up. We Some like them too. Have still chewed do you them. do the PVC or do you get into the uh, I, not, the metal the white ones. plastic? The yeah, white plastic. Yeah, the PVC. Yeah. yeah, but they're good to clean. Nancy, another thing, we're both anal freaking retentive about cleaning and basically. Oh, that make that three of us. <laughs> <laughs> He's getting, he's getting better. He's getting better. I guess right. Nancy knows me a little better. <laughs> if this podcast had happened about five years ago when we were all settling in, it wouldn't have been as smooth as today. All right. We're going to do our quirky question of the day coming from our producer because he legitimately struggles sometimes with his dogs and he needs help. And we're ben, like, ben yeah. Ben is pumping us for dog advice we're all like, the time. We're Go like, ahead, ben, ben, we already podcasted. We're out of here. So we're going to focus a little bit, all three trainers on Ben. What do you got? So I have the two puppies, as you guys know, mm -hmm. and the younger one, Milo, who's the boy, obviously, he has some trouble on walks paying attention, and mm -hmm. he can sometimes get laser focused into something, and it is damn near impossible to break his concentration. We've tried high value treats. We've tried a couple of different tactics, mm -hmm. and we haven't been able to figure it out yet. Okay. So basically what I'm looking for is, is there some kind of technique that I haven't been employing yet or something that doesn't involve treats? All right, well, to let's, try and focus. I guarantee let's you there's some techniques you let's haven't employed go. yet. Like, <laughs> go ahead, Nancy. We're going to start go. with our guest. Let's go left to right. We'll answer it as though we're reading. Okay. High voltage coming up. Easy. <laughs> <laughs> I would start with training him alone. That's a good one. Without the other dog. Just you, so you can focus on him. Um, keep him below. Did he say that they're both out together at the same time when this happens? or? Yeah, it usually happens yeah. when they're okay. both out at the same right. time. We listened well enough that yeah. we knew that okay. point. This, is, this <laughs> is similar to Scott. Hi, I'm Scott, the dog trainer. What's your name? My name's Susan. My husband's name's Bob. Hi, what is your name, uh, Susan's husband? Bob. Let's, let's, this is typical okay. Scott. This is how it goes. <laughs> let's so, not distract from Nancy's advice here. I think here, I'm going to have wine every freaking time we podcast. I'm waiting on baby <laughs> All right, breath. So training him individually. Well, you'd, uh, prior to putting him in distraction, teach him some core skills that he can respond to and get highly rewarded and build the value of you to him, uh, and then bring him out gradually in the distractible areas to the level that he can respond. If you're over-facing him, the horse has left the barn, and there's not really anything you can do but at that point other than just take him by the collar and say, we're going home, son. Because you can't train when he's in that mind state. Oh, when do the hot dogs come in? That's what I'm waiting for. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I a, thought the whole core of the whole thing was the hot dog. You are such a pain in the ass. Okay. Uh, we are you to, done? Yes, I can. Nice we work. Used to, uh, nice work. We used to. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> We used to call me the hot dog lady when we were in our facility, and then my uh, business became Cookie That, because I was like, Cookie That, give the dog a cookie, so we uh, we align on the cookie front. I would say, as far as the distraction stuff goes, what Nan said, find different ways to figure it out. But a lot of times, like if you pour his food, he's going to get into that red zone, even there. Like If he's on a leash in the house, and you go to pour his food, so utilize as many things as you can that you have at your disposal. Liz coming home will probably be like, if he's on a leash, like, can't see you, mind blank, mind blank, and basically... 
if you can create distance, like I'm really hardcore about this. Like if my dogs will not take a carrot in front of the decoy, like when we're doing bite work, fine, you're not going to bite. You want to take a carrot 20 feet away, fine. Take a carrot five feet away. You don't want to do that. We're not going to play because your food is the only thing that you have to leverage your kind of wager with, with the dog. And if that doesn't mean anything and they're like, screw you, I'm in the red zone, screw your food, then you don't have a lot. And you're not bribing, but it's just like, hey, can you make the right choice to sit and look at me? Okay, now you can see mommy. And a lot of times if we get creative, we can come up with ways at home that shows that. So what are you going to do? You go on high voltage or where Jeez, are you going? I don't know. You guys cover all the bases here. <laughs> I know. This is, um, why, this is why we just train and Scott just, so she's keeping First of all, I'd ask. Getting how, the distraction at home where we were talking about an environmental yeah. distraction. Now, when you she's say, saying, when you say, are you done, Nancy? <laughs> Can we just ditch him? Okay. <laughs> well, he does serve a purpose. When you He's say quite my- funny. <laughs> and you know, you guys are cutting yeah. into my two minutes. Okay. <laughs> it's like the debate. <laughs> Excuse me, Nancy. This is not what you no. agreed to. This is not what your she's performance a plus K9.com agreed to. She's a liar. She's a liar. <laughs> she's a liar. <laughs> oh, shut up, man. She's a liar. <laughs> oh, man. Come on, man. <laughs> <laughs> enough is enough. Go ahead. I'm just I'm just stalling because I know you're still thinking about your answer. No, so I'm I don't. Trying to help I, you. I, he I doesn't even I, have an answer. I don't think. <laughs> How old is Milo? First of all, he said oh, he's a puppy. Oh, yeah. Nine months. Because I have talk people come neutering? in. I got a four year old dog, and it's a puppy still. <laughs> nine months. So okay. you're nine month old. Okay, just because so, I call Vital a puppy doesn't mean we need to bring that up right I now. Rest my point there. <laughs> uh, and then I would ask, what is it that distracts your puppy? Is there something? Is it movement? Is it just everything? Is it leaves that blow by in front? Or is it squirrels? Don't spill my he's line. typically very good about anything like that. He's a deer. He's okay with it. Yeah. I notice it the most when, and I probably should have included this in when I was prepping. See, everything. I'm digging for a little more information. <laughs> what is, if my other How am I dog, close the deal it's your years of expertise. If my other dog Maggie is in front of him, uh-huh. and maybe she's doing something, okay, then it's all focused on. Yeah. I need to get back in front of her. I got gotcha. you. Yeah. I got. Gotcha. So maybe that's what. It, it's, have you considered tying weights to Maggie? <laughs> She's already a dead weight. <laughs> but that's what it is. Him, him wanting to be in front. Yeah. Seemingly. Well, There's been other times where it's not quite that case, but the majority of the times this happens, it usually seems to be that it's A little bit of a power Maggie's struggle between the two of them, you think, or he's, he's trying to get ahead of her all the yeah. time. Yeah. Well, if it's that simple, and are you walking both dogs at the same time? Yeah. He's not even joking. Maggie's got a shorter leash. He really isn't. It's okay. Oh, wait, listen, well, well, but you're, we always, uh, hang on. Well, I'm, my two minutes is getting stopped. Because on. we've already made a joke about your time, memory collection. <laughs> time. So okay. that's interesting because I actually do the opposite. I have Milo on the shorter uh, lease and Maggie on the longer leash. And, you, and the problem hasn't been fixed yet, right? No. So, okay. <laughs> switch that over. <laughs> <laughs> so now you're going to switch over. Now the reason I bring this up. I didn't need your common sense. The reason... <laughs> The reason I'm suggesting this, this is because that often, what, they, so what they're talking volunteer. about, they're talking about training. Okay. Now, We're talking, Scott's these talking people, about what These people tells. enjoy training. They find a problem. They take this problem with their puppy and turn it into a career. Okay? I'm assuming that you enjoy producing these sh- the like podcasts podcasting. more than dog training. So I'm trying to come up with some, some realistic solutions for you. Yeah. And if it is that, that's why I said if it was a... Just a, give him his way. If it was right. a prey-driven situation where it was chasing movement, skateboards, things like that, then you'd be working on that in your... You'd have to be desensitizing your dog to those type of things mm-hmm. and whatnot. And but also... If it's a, if it, I, that's a pretty common thing, one wanting to get ahead yeah. of the other and all that stuff. Yeah. And like you said, there's another precursor there that, you know, he's feeding off the other dog. So a lot of times the big problem starting about five minutes earlier, you just have to be a little more in tune than like, oh, I'm enjoying my walk. And that's what people don't want to do. And that's why our business is and so if hard. And if I was going to give you a real extreme training scenario, I'd say take them one at a time and see, evaluate the behavior when they're alone <laughs> and see if oh, but it's But hold on, it's are they issue. walking together though? That's what I'm wondering. Yeah, one's ahead of the other. <laughs> <laughs> This all, this all comes up on the way home, like me being like, see, I made this point seven minutes ago. And then by the time I make the point and he makes the point, he's on the phone, he doesn't even recognize Really, the then. point is that when I had my two minutes, <laughs> all I heard was Nancy and Jess. You were better, you had, were better with your chocolate. Have yeah. your chocolate. All right, I got to read this because we're going back no, to- I hope that I gave you some sound uh, yeah, advice. I, thank you. You yeah. all gonna, gave me I will sound be following advice. up with you next week. I want you to send- Unlike the other two. I want you to, <laughs> I want you to send Scott a picture of Milo having the longer leash. Okay. So yeah. this is funny. So a girl that um, I went to high school with, she, we uh, actually studied abroad in Mexico this together. This two years ago. <laughs> Shut up. 
I graduated from high school in friggin' 2005. So um, she says, I jumped on your podcast. I, she says, I jump on your podcast to hear your laugh. It's still so contagious and cheerful, mm-hmm. which is so sweet. But it's funny because Nancy's here. And what did Sylvia Bishop say about Nancy when we went to the Sylvia Bishop yeah. Cinema? Did I go to Sylvia Bishop? No, but you heard it. She said, this lady, where's Sylvia from, England? Yeah. She said, Nancy is the laughing queen of America. Oh. <laughs> so I was just thinking that on top of the strong female presence and the drunken afternooners, we also have the laugh going on. So this is a lot for Scott. Are we going to do my cannabis update? More no, important. we already did that. You're, the trees oh. are cut down. It's over. Let's talk more about pet dog We'll training. get into quality next week. All right. Let's talk about how we structure our different houses and how that affects our lives and our training and everything else. So what do you do to keep your dogs under control legitimately? Me? Yeah. Um, Besides have me handle them. <laughs> which, which is something, honestly, he could if I said. If I don't want my dogs roaming around the house and getting into mischief, I would uh, tell them to get on a dog bed or something like that. Uh, if I'm... Now, our dogs, again, they're sport dogs. They're higher drive dogs. The older dogs do whatever the hell they want to do because when they get past a certain age, typically they're content to just relax and not get into yeah, trouble. Yeah, we don't really have but if you a have a, strong if you have senior a dog, contingent, though, right now. Um, if you have an old... My, well, my border collie's... Sorry He's eight. He just doesn't have any rules. This yeah, isn't he about, has no rules. This isn't about he's a senior. No, but I mean, if I'm... This take, body wants his freaking feet rubbed by Scott. If I'm doing something and I, I don't want to be dealing with the dogs, uh, I'll put them in the crate. I'll just put them in no. the crate. All right, so what about you? How do you manage at home? Uh, they're either crated or on a bed mm-hmm. or just located in one room. And even in your yard, Nancy just put in this great pool. So um, in the spring, it's all ready to rock for her dogs because she's a much better dog owner than us. Um, <laughs> and even in your yard, they're controlled well. Yes. There's different areas that I rotate them through. Yeah, and that's not because they don't freaking get along. It's just to keep the energy level down, right. to keep the risk of injury down. If it's a free-for-all all the time at home and everybody's jumping on the counter, pulling things off the counter, everything else. And then you get into a training class, you get into a trial situation when now your hot dogs are gone, your tools are gone. Even if your tool is just a leash, then the dogs are going to be like, "Woo! it's like we're at home. It's a big free for all. So it's not that every moment of the day, it has to be micromanaged, but control is a big part of living with dogs. Right. Well, it's a way of um, minimizing problem behaviors Mm -hmm. in dogs and, it's counterintuitive. Repetition it's, builds behavior. So if you get bullshit at home, you're going to get it at other places. What people think. Yeah. I just had a call yesterday with a lady that has a dog that's two that has bit three or four people over the past few months. And, they, and, I, and it was a rescue. But they got the rescue at four months. And I said, well, did you use a crate? And it's the kind of the typical scenario where when they got the dog, they created the dog. Everything was great. They did classes. The dog was a year old. The potty training was all dialed yeah. in. They got rid of the crate. They get rid of this. They back, you know, they said, well, we, you know, we kind of backed off on the training. The dog gets looser and looser and looser. And now the dog starts, you know, acting more intuitively to what a dog would do, which Mm. is chasing Mm. stuff, barking out the window, biting strangers that come to the house. Scott always has the happy stories. The real feel, (laughs) the real feel good is about pet dog ownership. But the thing is, I say it's counterintuitive what we're doing because a lot of people are listening to this going, I don't want my dog in a crate all the time. Why don't you train the dog? Why can't the dog just be loose? Well, when they're mature enough to handle just being loose and hanging out, they can be. Yeah. But a lot of dogs, it takes them much longer than you'd think right. yeah. for them to be to a point where they don't need a lot of direction. They can just hang out, come and go as they please. Especially males. They can mature slower. Rescues can have a bunch of baggage that they With need the to accept, work through. And even if you had a big farm, like a big piece of property where the dogs are just really just coming and going uh, at will... Um, a lot of the young dogs are going to make up their own games. They're chasing the chickens around. They're taking mm-hmm. pigs down. They're killing Yeah, they're bunnies. doing all kinds yeah. of crazy stuff, you yeah. know. And that may be fine on your property, but when you go out in the world, those behaviors that's are not, not and thought that's well not, of. And that's yeah. not good for their mental space. Right. And like another thing, because um, I think that we can kind of impart some knowledge here onto even just basic pet owners that aren't competing. But another thing is like noise overnight. So in the morning, you like to sleep. I mm-hmm. mean, you sleep less now, but you, uh, you don't wake up because your dogs wake you up, right? No. And same thing with us. I'd say when we got together, Scott thought like hard and fast, you know, got to get up at six, got to put the dogs out. If it's nine, sometimes they know now like, all right, we got up, we meditated, we had breakfast. Well, I actually had a routine out. of getting up and going to work when I first met you. And that <laughs> oh, is, yeah. the, that is, yeah, deep I really, we're not even out of bed until I 9.30. I really took like, his hard working <laughs> and just put it down the drain. No, but we meditate or sometimes we'll go to the gym and like dogs can live through that. They're not freaking like, hey, bitch, get up and feed me breakfast. And 
even eating, that's another big area where there's routines. Mm-hmm. So um, you feed in crates a lot, I know. But how else? Like, what are some scenarios of how you'd feed? You train sometimes. At the school, feed. I feed them in the crates. Yep. At home, um, I feed them. They're out, mm-hmm. but they're separated, you yeah. know. And I'm present the yeah. whole and time then, they're like, eating. I don't just leave, give them the food and walk away. And then you're going to do Gimme's Utility in a Mask, which i got to get you doing some stairs in a mask. I'm <laughs> worried about having to, a new mask and, uh, why and do for you have obedience. Why do you because it's COVID, it's sweetie. I know, but it's a proximity to the judge. Because you're in the ring by yourself. They're making, yeah, they're making you wear masks. Everybody's doing the it's same really path disaffor- for healing. It's a very no. liberal organization. Oh, my God, stop it. He says he cannot smoke cigars on the <laughs> freaking podcast again. He's cut off. But no, if you're going to trial, Is you'll it? train sometimes for dinner. Right, yeah. So what would that look like? Uh, the other dogs would eat, and Gimme and his bowl and me would go outside. Yeah, and you freaking, and dinner's productive. It's not right. just like, here's your food, you need food, and then, oh, here's your food, let's go train for an hour after you've had dinner. Like, no, like, uh, let's freaking work for your food, dude, and let's give us the best that you can give us so we can do as well as we can at the trial. You can feed your dogs hot dogs for dinner? <laughs> no. <laughs> Raw food. <laughs> what about us? How do we feed? Not that you feed, but what, what kind of structure do we have to feeding? Well, they all eat in the crates. Yeah, or or with structure in the kitchen, like an automatic sit with, and all of these little things. Like it seems stupid, but all of these little things matter. Same thing as door behavior. You're big on door behavior. Yeah. One thing that I take for granted with our dogs, all the dogs that we have in our house, is that they eat when they're offered food. Oh. They eat everything they're given every time they're offered food. If they don't, then there's something wrong. Yeah, yeah. that's a big indicator to us. It's a health issue. Uh, It's not like oh, they're spoiled rotten potatoes. People that leave food out. And the dog starts grazing and all that crap. They yeah, never know what the good. dog's eating. Right. And it, and you yeah. can't use your food for any kind of leverage because they don't give a shit. Right. Yeah. You know, and your dogs are better, I'd say, about pet dog manners than our dogs. Um, they're not like flying on people and jumping on people and stuff. But you let your dogs jump up and bark. I mean, yeah. it's not like they're, they can't do anything naughty. It's just you're in control of yeah, when you want dog, it to oh, freaking when, stop. When, when they can do it. Yeah. If I <clears> tell yeah. them enough. That then they that s- means enough. Yeah. yeah. That's the way my dogs are too is that I don't have the typical pet dog control that my clients have as far as or what my parents uh, my clients don't want their dogs to jump on gas they don't want their dogs mm. to do all these things we do and i'm not telling my dog <laughs> we yeah. want him to be happy yeah. and free. <laughs> i want my dog if, if, yeah i let my dogs be looser but i can yeah. say go lay down that's enough and they're done and or go get on your bed right. like we can manage them the difference is if you can't manage it then you do have to control jumping but like as much as this all seems like peripheral stuff like yeah 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 whatever it doesn't matter like all of this ties into scoring well on a ring two field. All of this ties into arch points. Like, and if you don't believe that, that's totally fine, but try to restructure your home life differently a week before a trial and see what happens. Even we've well, had the talk before, even just crating more sometimes, right. like just cause a dog's older, if they're just, you know, enjoying every moment of their life, then try to crate them a week before you trial. Does that make a difference? And if it does, then use that to your advantage. Have them be hungry. Not that they never come out of the crate, but just that basic structure again, like implementing like younger dog structure and an older dog can sometimes well, there help. are some, I mean, coming from the, the protection sports, I knew many, many people early on and still to this day that their sport dogs are not house dogs at all. They're raised in kennels. Well, and that's the difference. And they're not between, even in the house. But right. that's the difference. And if they were loose in the house, they'd lift their leg on the couch, and they would just yeah. do all kinds of stupid stuff. Yeah, yeah. and they're purely sport dogs. But if yeah. you want to have a companion that you go hiking with, and, and same thing with police dogs. If police dogs live in kennels outdoors, that's fine. They have a specific purpose. They have a specific time to work. But those types of dogs, I would say, if they did need to go in somewhere or they did need to fly somewhere, they would still be well-behaved. They have good enough obedience that right. they could use it if they needed to. They just choose not the, to live the, with the, the dogs. The dog would have to be under stimulus control the entire time. And Malinois time. are right. also yeah. a bigger pain in the ass than golden retrievers or something else. But there's ways that you can manage things. Not golden doodles, though. <laughs> <laughs> they are. They are blowing they're, up. They're getting to be a handful. <laughs> Is there anything that you're, we're missing that we can impart onto people? Because it seems just so... Well, it's more than just asking your dog to sit and then feeding them for his meal. I mean, you, yes. you, whatever you're working on, that behavior has to be perfected by using and you have to test you're just getting all smoky joe out here and you have to test those things sometimes if it's going well when when you just say sit and it's funny we have people like their mental clock is like sit one one thousand two one thousand free eat your dinner like you know what i mean like then wait till ten one thousand one day or pick up the food like test the dog dogs like to be challenged for a week see how they deal with it (laughs) well and and that's true because (laughs) gimme who we know is soft is now. Gimme is the best dog in the world, just so we can put that out there publicly on the podcast. So I made his meal times a real struggle for him. Mm-hmm. Why would you do that? 
as I'm just so mean. <laughs> I'm gonna make because your... I, I want to prove him without annihilating him. I want right. to build him up that you can do this. Right. And and I want him to want what I have bad enough that he's like, all right, I'm going to grow up here. It's and giving I'm him be able confidence to do and building right. frustration tolerance. So with his meal, I have him and Goody out, and I'm doing it outside. So Goody's got... the bad one, if anyone wondered about that. <laughs> Interesting naming there. So everybody's outside in the yard, and so I may just have Goody do, because um, I'm working on Gimme, I'll make Goody do some spin, some crazy mm-hmm. things, and do like five or six of them before I'm going to give him his food, not just one. Mm-hmm. Then while he's eating, now I'm going to do a competition exercise with Gimme. So he's got to focus on me. When his brother's already mm-hmm. eating, I have his... And when his brother got to go cuckoo crazy, spinning right. out of control, and now he's got to do some really thoughtful things. And, like, it's just like Nancy's really good about the mental acuity. Nancy's sharp as can be. And, like, people that go... Oh, she's sharper than you, pal. Um, uh, people that, like, maybe have dementia, or they go into, like, old people homes or whatever, you know, when they get older, if they haven't been playing solitary or doing Sudokus or, like, exercising mm. the organ that is the brain and, like, expanding that rubber band, they go to mush quicker from what right. I've seen. I've had a lot of older, older relatives and a lot of friends with rel- It's like, if you have a sharper mind, no matter what hits you, you're normally sharper. And it's the same thing with the dogs. The dogs right. don't want to live in mush. Like, they like to be pushed. They like to be challenged. That's why we get these dogs that are, like, super intelligent and figuring things out and problem solving because they want their minds to be expanded. And it helps build resist resilience. Because, like, say I just was working on uh, signals with the front, okay? So he's got to do all the three signals mm-hmm. perfectly, which means no moving forward because you're excited about the mm-hmm. food. Once he fails, we have to redo. Uh-huh. It's so like, there's a bigger response cost to eating. And right. the thing is, like, yes, does the dog be like, oh, my freaking God, you're making me be perfect? Yes, but it, it makes it better the next session. He's right. not making that mistake over and over and over again. So all these little things do feed into the bigger picture. And if your noise is increasing or if your problem behaviors are increasing or your dog's becoming more destructive or maybe aggressive or reactive, like that's coming from somewhere. That's coming from a lack of mental stability and control in our opinion. And that doesn't mean that now you have to go kick your dog's ass, but you maybe have to reel them in a little bit and be like, huh, that came out of nowhere. Last time I came down to you, Vital was a little bit too much and I've since fixed that. She Mm. was a little bit barky, a little bit, a little bit much. Like just tone it down. Don't even shake your head about little bop ever. (laughs) (laughs) You know, I was going to say, say though, one um, thing about my little bup. A lot of, um, again, getting into the pet dog training, uh, a lot of these uh, clients do the homework and they get into a routine of these, of this, whatever these things they're doing, to the point where the dog's perfect. It's very contextual, and then right. when they anything changes, it's just everything monotonous. falls apart. Yeah, if, right. if the dog's sitting for dinner and your spouse walks in, they'll be like, ah, "Hi!" Like that doesn't mean that the dog. Does your dog sit and stay? Yeah, it does for dinner. Does well, your dog sit and stay when your kids come home? Well, if it doesn't, then you should work that. Yeah. I right. mean, you want these behaviors to transfer out of the house. Right. You know? To and generalize. So, yeah. And uh, so you That's gotta... the whole point. Practical usage. <clears throat> this yeah. isn't just parlor tricks. Like, we're not spending all this money on training. So now, with like... that being said, you don't need to make your dogs neurotic. And, you know, some dogs... You know, <laughs> My you, dogs you, don't listen you anymore can, you can now over... that they live with you 24-7. <laughs> to... I'm there to provide balance. <laughs> I have to say, <laughs> my dog. If I wasn't like, there, they'd be in the. <laughs> if I walked into the laundry room and the the washing machine's going, a little bop's like, "Daddy, it's scary." I come out and he's like, "You're okay, little bop. Everything's fine. Mommy will be. Okay. Mommy will take care of you. It's fine." But See, what not, you said about dog. the repetition and practicing yes, it, and it setting matters. This, it does because you, initially, when you're doing that, yes, you're you're managing the dog. You're technically training the dog how to yeah. do this. One day, all of a sudden, the dog just does it without you saying anything because yeah. it has now learned in these scenarios, this, this is, is what how I, I behave. do. Mm-hmm. So then you get the well-behaved pet dog that Behavior. it doesn't look like you trained, yeah. Yeah. but it's through It's just all, a way of life. It's right. through yeah. the lack right. of allowing for BS, in my right. opinion. And then also with that said, so it doesn't happen so much with the Goldens, but I would say Mal's, it's like a surefire thing. Dog does it great a hundred times. Like, okay, we go to the door, we sit, we go to the door, we sit. Then let's say the 101th time you go to the door, you say, sit, the dog looks at you like, I'm not going to sit. Well, in that moment, you need to know, like, is this a lack of... There seems to be a, a little of- malprejudice going on here. <laughs> She's worked with my dogs. And they like, to, loved, they like to push back. I loved Mal's until I met 20 that did bite work. Sarge, I thought, was the normal Mal. They're not. But the point is, at that 101th time, when they look at you, you need to be able to discern as a trainer... 
okay, are they testing me? Are they unclear? Was there a difference in circumstance, whatever else? And the worst possible thing, no matter if it's a Malinois or any other breed, is to be like, oh, they didn't feel like sitting right now, but they have to pee. Okay, let's go out and pee. That's when like, you get out the hot dog. I'll freaking... <laughs> <laughs> I'll freaking walk back up the stairs and be like, no problem, dude. Just like you're talking about with the response costs of not yeah. doing signals properly. No issue whatsoever. I don't care if it's 930 or not. Let's go all the way back upstairs and try that again. And then maybe we'll do that three times. And I get three good ones before you go out. So it's like, if you're going to test me, there's going to be something that I counter that with. And it's not about... And it's not a correction or a physical no, punishment it's just for the dog. so the dog is clear. So yes. here's the downside to that. And uh, there's way more upside from a training perspective. Your dog will get it. Your dog will be much more consistent. 40 minutes it's, in, he's got a devil's advocate. It. Let's go. No, it's more work on your part. You have to actually go walk go. all the way back, put right. the damn yeah. dog away. Yeah. And that's the part where people are like, oh, lazy. I don't want to do that's that. That's the right. part where we put the blind up right here, and we have this trainer, and then we have us. But that's the part. <laughs> is that... No, you <laughs> have to freaking take... <laughs> I'm endorsing what you said. And you're putting, he did. You're I know. The, you're putting the blind up. Because you don't... You Because that's ex you're describing yourself. Sometimes I'm saying, you don't feel like doing it. I'm saying that... I'm we saying, do follow through. <laughs> that's a key component with what we do. It'll be like, Jimmy, get in the crate. Jimmy's digging up the bed. Ah, close enough. You're in the right room. I'll be right there to bed. <laughs> but that... I, I but pick my battles. It's true, well. but also <laughs> there is a certain... Like I would say, and I, Scott and, is. And by one the of, way, anytime you want to put uh, Jimmy up against any of your dogs, <laughs> just let me know. Hey, Nancy, you name whatever sport you want to do. <laughs> I don't care. I'm ready. You want to do nose work, bite work, okay. ag agility. <laughs> no, but with that said, um, Scott is by far one of the most influential trainers in my life, but these really like successful crazy I people teach her what not to do do no they do have a certain <laughs> level of ocd and you have you and yeah. i have that too and that's not necessarily healthy and it's certainly not necessarily healthy if you have a freaking border collie like i do but the whole point is like what level are you willing to accept and if you're willing to like let a few things slide if that affects your performance at least be aware of that right. that's the only thing is that you need to be aware of what you're letting go scott will let his dogs do whatever but if he says hey freaking get over here and lay down, they'll lay at his feet for an hour. They know to freaking right. listen. So it's just about creating balance in sport and in life and a happier relationship. I would yeah. say your relationship grows when you do yeah, these things. Yeah, I think so too. And the thing is, yeah. all of this, what all of this leads to is being able to take your dog to an open space in public, taking your dog off leash and feeling okay. Yeah. I can let my dog be off or leash Or having here. your dog get out of the car accidentally yeah. or having something crazy happen in the ring. The judge throws a clipboard across the ring and your dog looks at you like, well, that was a little bit screwy, but here I am in my stand. I didn't flinch. Like that yeah. is the good training. And it's not so much... This is less about our ego and more about we want our dogs to be confident. We want our dogs to be clear. We want our dogs to do well. You're the first one that you'd rather have a dog, a happy dog, leave the ring and fail than have a dog that has less attitude. Right. It's important. Well, you can always tell how together. much ego is involved uh, when you walk off the ring, out of the ring and the dog hasn't done well and you're really pissed. <laughs> <laughs> you, that's ego that you're all pissed but off. Oh, you walk out and you laugh and say, "Well, yeah. I missed that." I would one. <laughs> say, I would say both of you are better about that. Maybe I'll give myself a little credit. <laughs> Reeled you both in there, but it's important. It's important. The only reason we freaking do dog sports, and I know we're going longer than normal, and it's the wine, and part of it's Nancy's it's Scott's love of Nancy. I can tell already. Well, sad. she's buying lunch, so <laughs> <laughs> I want to make sure she gets plenty of airtime. Thank you, Scott. <laughs> No, but the, the, the main issue here, I would say, is that you want a healthy relationship with your dog. You want a, a relationship where you can go on vacation with your dog Let's, if you want to. You even, can do well you in the ring so if you want to. You could so far to say a pleasurable relationship yes. with your dog. Forget yes. healthy and Not unhealthy. a sick relationship where the dog like is inconsolable because it's not with you. And all these weird little things like, oh, the, I had to pee and the dog had to be at my feet when I peed. Like, no, you just want your dog, just like you guys both have been parents. You want to raise well-rounded children. You want to raise well-rounded dogs. Let's not use kids as an example. <laughs> dogs are much easier than kids to raise. All right. You can put them any, in a crate. Do you have any parting words since apparently we got to give you all your air time here? I think that wine's really kicked in, Nancy. You're really loosening yeah, up I'm, over there. I'm mellow now. I think we should do yeah. another. We'll, we'll do another podcast when this ends. <laughs> We're going live at one. <laughs> oh, Jesus. No, but I, I think we covered most things. Yeah, I think we did. Too. And don't let your dogs be assholes. We right. have been in the pet dog industry for a long freaking time and things are deteriorating. Yeah, life yeah. skills are necessary. Yes. And the millennials don't have it either. Well, the, <laughs> so. pro the problem is, though, the dogs are getting more restricted by local towns and whatnot because their right. behavior sucks so bad. Right. They don't want dog parks in yeah, the towns. It's not discrimination. They're, they're the dogs are actually breeds. jerks. They're doing all this stuff. Right. And a lot of it is justified. The dogs are out there just really being idiots. And the people are like, oh, I don't know what to do. Yeah. 
Yeah. So if you guys are in Southern Mass um, near the Rainham area, Performance Plus Canine offers boarding, daycare, day trains, um, a bunch of classes, a lot of great stuff. I go down there and train with Nance. It's a great facility. Um, and really if you have any questions. Beautiful location you have, Nance. Thank it you. It is. And if you have any questions about any of this stuff or you want to tighten stuff up with your dogs, write us, studio at thecorkydog.com. And we really do want to help society have more well behaved dogs and have better dog owner relationships because that's really the thing. It's not just about loving your dog and having this like kind of borderline unhealthy relationship with your dog. It's about having a partnership. We domesticated animals to have companions, like make them a companion that you can do anything with because it's an honor to own a dog and you should be doing your part of the bargain as far as I'm concerned. Right. All right, cheers. I think this whole wine thing on the podcast is great. <laughs> yeah, we'll guys. see you next week. We got coffee, empty coffee. Uh, studio at thequirkydog.com if you guys need anything. And in the meantime, keep it quirky. So oh, proud I that you matched so I know, well. I matched the pig. <laughs> what a thrill. <laughs> I expect to see that next week, that you dressed for the pig. <laughs> The views and opinions expressed by the hosts, guests, or callers of this program do not necessarily reflect the opinions of the Studio 21 Podcast Cafe, the United Podcast Network, its partners or affiliates.